Hello, welcome to the Brazilian Health Nut Show. Here you will find cutting edge information provided by the best experts in the world so you can learn how to burn fat for the rest of your life. Bruno da Gama is the Brazilian Health Nut in a mission to solve the problems you have when trying to lose weight forever. He is a nutritional therapy practitioner, a certified personal trainer, and a holistic lifestyle coach by the Czech Institute. Don't forget to say hello and sign up to our free newsletter at www.brazilianhealthnet.com. Let's go! Thank you so much for being here, Gray, with me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Can you please talk a little bit about your story, like from Leo Gray to the founder of NTA, Nutritional Therapy Association? Okay. <laughs> well, you know, uh, some looking back, it seems like destiny, but, you know, the first half of my life, you know, before I was 40 years old, I wasn't concerned much about health at all because I was, you know, I was an athlete and I was uh, naturally you know, had good health, but my, my first career had me traveling constantly. I traveled all over the United States uh, with my first job and um, mostly driving. And, um, you know, it was just a fast food lifestyle. So you know, I always make a joke of it. I'd go by a McDonald's and back in those days it would say, uh, three billion served, you know. <laughs> and I'd always say to, say to myself, who ate the other two billion, you know, because I'd eaten so many Big Macs and uh, uh, Egg McMuffins and those uh, terrible, uh, for breakfast, probably 50% of the time I had an Egg McMuffin and those horrible hash browns that are fried in hydrogenated oils. And, uh, yeah. and um, you know, not really taking good care of myself. You know, what I, what I believed, which is uh, not true, is that if you, if you exercise enough, you can eat whatever you want and, you know, go out and run five miles, it would set you back to zero. And um, that's, those, those bad belief systems, exercise is certainly important, but it won't compensate for a bad diet. In fact, it will actually exacerbate bad diet. Right. So by the time I was 40, a major change happened in my life. My, we were expecting our first, uh, our first, first and only child, my son um, Grayson, and um, all of a sudden, you know, the reality was that I was uh, quite unhealthy, that I had very definable signs of heart disease, and I'd lost a lot of my vitality, and, um, you know, I was uh, struggling, uh, not terribly, but a bit with my weight. And mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden, you know, more than ever before, you know, it was really important to me to be healthy for my son. You know, I had a vision that if I didn't make changes that I wouldn't be there for him, you know, when he was grown up. So um, I was very fortunate to, uh, through, through my chiropractor, uh, I was in, the, in a position of looking for a new profession and um, and he he just looked at me and you know we 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 got we were good friends we were actually over at Catalina Island and uh, I was telling him that you know I was I needed to start a new profession I had been kind of for five years uh, not working seriously just messing around with boats and you know things like that and he just looked at me and he said I know exactly what you should do you should you should work for a friend of mine who's a doctor who sells n nutritional supplements to doctors. And um, I said, oh, that sounds really interesting, but I don't know anything about that. And uh, his comment was, well, don't worry, the doctors don't either. <laughs> so that's, I thought it was kind of strange at the time. but well, yeah. I, So I, I embraced, uh, I, I got to go to work for a company that sold therapeutic nutrients. And, I, and um, fortunately, San Diego is also the home of the Price Pottinger Nutrition Foundation. And I connected up with the then uh, executive director, Pat Connolly. And uh, it was a big part of my education was studying Weston Price's work and mm -hmm. understanding, you know, kind of the pioneer of epigenetics really was uh, Francis Pottinger. Did you know about the, the foundation before all of that? No, no. Dr. Curry, who was my mentor and my boss, introduced me to the foundation. And, um, but immediately, you know, when I, when, I, when I started that work, I knew that I had found, you know, my job, you know, my, my calling, what I, what I had a passion for. And that was what was really important to me was to have a job that I could embrace passionately. So I, I embraced it. I mean, my job basically was to sell, you know, nutritional supplements to doctors. But as a result of that and all the studying, I, I developed a strong philosophy about um, nutrition. And um, 
within um, about a year and a half of starting that, that job, I was doing lectures to, small lectures, um, two-hour lectures to groups of doctors. I would gather together a group of doctors in one of their offices, and I would talk to them about the same things that we talk about in the nutritional therapist training class. You know, we would talk about, we had f- five modules basically, digestion, blood sugar, mm-hmm. fatty acids, minerals, and actually we had four. Hydration. Yeah, we didn't do hydration then. Oh, okay. They added that later, but of course a very important topic. Yeah. And the lectures were very, very popular, and um, I would bring together kind of the philosophy that I'd learned from, from Price Pottinger Foundation and the functional testing that I'd learned from uh, Dr. Curry and uh, 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 other other people like uh, George Goodhart and Wally Schmidt and Robert Blake and others, mm-hmm. and I uh, put together, you know, with a, a lot of help from uh, Dr. Curry, I put together these little talks. They were very very popular, and after doing mm-hmm. that for about a year, we put it together into a more formal class for doctors where they actually paid money to come, and uh, we formalized it. And I would co-teach it with different doctors with different specialties. So not being a doctor myself, I always felt more comfortable that there was a doctor I taught it with, uh, chiropractors and acupuncturists and medical doctors. And um, finally, one of the chiropractors, he said, he said, I love your seminar. He said, but um, he said, um, you know, why do you think you always have to teach with these, with these doctors? You know? And I go, well, because they, they really understand the science and can answer all the tough questions. And he goes, yeah, but what you don't understand is that's the stuff we already know. We all learned that in, in medical school or chiropractic college. He said, "I'll pay you. I'll pay you double if you'll just do it by yourself." You know, <laughs> because what I really embraced was the philosophy of it, yes. the functional yeah. testing, and um, kind of the uh, you know came up with a systemic approach mm-hmm. to addressing a client. You know, in front of you, how how do you best serve this client as a nutritionist? And, yeah. uh, as you know, you know, having been through the nutritional therapist training course yourself, we have a very strong philosophy about this idea. That people have a number of problems. They don't. They don't really go to a doctor because they think their fatty acids are out of balance, or they think they might be dehydrated. They go because they're suffering, and usually their suffering relates to horrible immune problems. You know, um, you know, thyroid issues or um, female endocrine problems or male performance problems, and 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 or or, or and or they they have uh, you know cardiovascular. They've got they become hypertensive. And, or um, have other cardiovascular issues, but the reality is that those are the end processes of weaknesses in these foundations. You don't just wake up one day and get heart disease. You, yeah, it's a process. Yeah, it's a process of doing a lot of things wrong for a long time. And if you look back at any of the modern conditions that plague our society, diabetes, heart disease, obesity, they really have their roots in people's inability to digest properly, their inability to manage their blood sugar. I mean, I think we all recognize now that uh, diabetes and pre-diabetes is a is a is an epidemic of almost unbelievable proportions. They've been eating the wrong kind of fats. People became fat phobic in the 70s, and they were eating insufficient amount of fats, poor quality fats, and fats out of balance. And they don't have the minerals to sustain good health because, you know, mineral-rich foods. Um, and, and uh, both in animal and vegetable products, basically been eliminated from the diet as we as we started eating more and more processed foods. And last but not least, of course, you know people are chronically dehydrated. You know, less than mm-hmm. from reading Dr. Botman Geldish's book. The- yeah, that's an amazing book. I always recommend to people to just read that book. You're gonna understand the importance of water in your life. It's yeah. so so good. Oh so important and, yeah you know, there's no excuse you know it doesn't cost much and it's readily available but people just they don't really get it they think drinking a diet soda or having a cup of coffee you know is hydrating them when it's really dehydrating them so mm-hmm. so anyway um, that all progressed I don't want to make the introduction too long but eventually <laughs> I really became aware that there was a need for a new profession and that you can teach the doctors all day long they don't really have the time a busy chiropractor, a busy medical doctor, a busy acupuncturist, whatever they're doing, they don't really have the time to, to really focus on, um, on, on good diet and uh, functional evaluation uh, and uh, proper use of nutritional supplements. And so I really decided that what we needed is we needed a holistic counterpart to the dietitians who, you know, in my opinion, are not really giving good advice. 
not most of them. Some there there is an emerging group of holistic dietitians that have some good ideas, but the conventional dietitians were just more of the same thing that got us into the hole that we're in. So I decided to start a new profession and. So the, the the way I get myself into trouble, uh, Bruno, is I, I just start telling people I'm going to do something, you know, without really knowing what the heck I'm saying. And then eventually, you know, I've said it so many times that in order to save face, I actually have to do it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's how I write. Someday I'm going to write a book, you know. Someday I'm going to start a new profession, you know. Someday I'm going to sail across the ocean. But yeah. so eventually, if I say it enough times and kind of vis- visualize, you know, what it's going to look like, uh, some somehow it happens. And you know, when we started teaching in 2001, the Nutritional Therapist Practitioner course, I always had a vision that it could be, you know, a, a national, international organization. And the fact that it now is, um, I don't know if you know this, but I'm currently teaching our inaugural class in Australia. In fact, mm. I'm no, I did. I did not know that. Yeah, so, uh, so I don't teach so many classes. We have 14 wonderful, you know, instructors that are trained and up and running and, uh, so, but I, 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 I don't know. There's just part of me that you know wanted to, yeah. to be the first one to Australia, and now I'm just starting a new, our first Canadian class. And so, awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. NTA. Uh, I always recommend to everybody, people who are interested in helping people to become healthier. I always go, go to NTA, check it out. It's so worth it. Um, we, you hit in so many topics that I want to talk to you a little later. But to start it off, I would like to get your opinion in the obesity epidemic. Why do you think there is so much problems nowadays, not just in the U.S., everywhere in Brazil, in Australia itself? Uh, so many, many problems with weight problems. Well, I mean, certainly the United States is the world leaders in obesity and poor health. You know, and it, it really stems back to put it into a historical perspective. I mean, we we ha- we 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 changed, started changing the diet and eating more and more processed foods around the turn of the century, but it was really exacerbated and became a critical problem after the Second World War. This, this is kind of the big landmarks after the Second World War, all these uh, highly processed foods like uh, margarines and um, concentrated and processed foods that were necessary to support the war effort were no longer needed for that. And um, so the, the uh, you know, uh, uh, business enterprise turned, that, turned those foods towards the American public to you know, somewhat ill effect. But I really trace one of the most profound changes was the result of um, um, a study that was done, it's called the Seven Nation Study, later renamed the Nine uh, Nation Study, where they looked at different nations in Europe and came to the conclusion that the ones that, this is not the conclusion of the study, but the interpretation of the study was right. that people that ate the lowest fat, you know, uh, were the healthiest and, and the thinnest. and. And the, the reality was that, that the study didn't show that, but that was the interpretation, and it fit, fit very, very well in, with our food manufacturing systems who, who wanted to use these highly processed vegetable oils and that we had this whole era of low-fat, high-carbohydrate high diets that have um, really um, been um, horrible to our health. So if you put that into a perspective, that all started in the late 60s, but really came into into uh, a full effect in the 70s. And so in the 70s, people embraced the low-fat diet, um, uh, you know, start to a degree shunned animal products and, um, uh, um, you know, uh, felt that any type of vegetable oil, no matter how, it, how highly processed, was better than any type of animal fat, no, no matter how natural and well-raised. And the result of that has been three generations of a very high glycemic, uh, not just low fat, but bad fat diet that's had profound effects on our, not our genetics, but our epigenetics. Mm-hmm. So I want to go back, you know, to um, Dr. Francis Pottinger's study with cats. When he, when he changed the diet of his cats in his famous study that he did in the 1930s, all he did really was take away a whole food and add a processed food with different degrees of processing and then different degrees of processing and added sugar. And then he measured the generational health of the kittens. And what he found was really quite profound is that that when he took an improper diet, this is very, very important for your listeners to to remember, when you take an improper diet, it it has effect on health. Of course, we, we recognize that. 
But what people don't understand is that when you take an improper diet and you hold the diet constant over several generations, that each generation becomes even less healthy than the generation before it. That's the epigenetic path. Yes. Um, the geneticists told us until just as recently as 15 years ago that that was impossible because there was no known mechanism where you could pass poor nutritional traits from one generation to the other. Except, of course, you know, from a mother who ate poorly to her child. But what we know now from Pottinger's study and from a major uh, epidemiological study that was done in Sweden is that what, what children eat profoundly affects the expression of the genes of their children and their grandchildren. And so what we're seeing now is the compounded effect of three generations of very, very poor diet in America. Yeah. Do you think that's why we have so many kids nowadays that have problems with obesity, even though you know they're not eating a lot, <laughs> or, and, but they still have problems with obesity? That might be due to this third generation, fourth generation of the potentures. Uh, I, know, might be. I mean, I think it, it's absolutely true. Yeah. I, mean, I spend a lot of time, uh, you know, uh, talking to people, public speaking, and one of the questions is, well, you know, I feed my children the same thing that we ate, but you know, we never got fat. We didn't. We didn't have braces. You know, we didn't. We didn't have crooked teeth. You know, we didn't have ADD, ADHD. You know, we certainly didn't have autism. So why would, if we're eating the same things, what's changed? And what's changed? There, there may be some other factors that have changed, but in my opinion. The big thing is that we're seeing this generational effect. So what, what, what you ate when you were, for, we now know as a result of the Swedish study, that when children eat during what's called the slow growth period, which is the age for girls between 8 and 11, right before puberty, and for boys between 9 and 12, what you feed a child at that age will have a profound effect on their children and their grandchildren. Wow. And so um, in the Overkalix study in Sweden, They found that when there was an abundance of uh, food, particularly high high carbohydrate foods like uh, potatoes and grains, that the children that grew up in those areas of kind of hyperabundance, that their grandchildren, the granddaughters and the grandsons of those boys and girls, they had uh, a 31 year shorter lifespan than the than the progeny of people who grew up in times of agricultural scarcity when their diet was more focused on their traditional foods of salmon and uh, pork yeah. and wild yeah. game and, uh, you know, wild, um, wild produce. And yeah, so. that, that reminds me of this book that I read by Kate Shanahan, I think that's her name. It's called Deep Nutrition, and she has a whole chapter just about how to make beautiful babies. And she goes into the importance of the parents' diet and the grandparents' diet and how it affects your baby. And we don't even realize if we think... Oh, it's just about what you're gonna be doing now, but no, everything that we're doing today has an influence on the next generation and the next one. Particularly what we feed our children. I mean, you know, there's very little generational consequence to what I eat because I'm 65 years old. You know, so I'm not going to be reproducing. But you know, what I ate as, as a child. Fortunately, you know, when I was young, my diet was pretty pretty good because it was just pre. It was, we certainly ate a lot of processed food, but not to, not to the degree that we do now. But you know, I'm believe me when I when my son was uh, was young, you know, I was given significant consideration to the health of my grandchildren. You know, we we fed him you know whole foods as much as possible, and you know he was raised on raw milk and you know uh, free range produce, uh, free range uh, meats and yeah. organic produce and things like that. Real food, real food, right? <laughs> I know, cool. it's, it's not that complicated. You know, yeah. I mean, it's not complicated. We we just need to to take a look at what our ancestors ate. I think one of the things is uh, everybody's you know saying what's the perfect diet. You know, so oh here's the perfect the pa perfect diet's the paleo diet. Well, the thing is, you know, I'm very much a fan of paleo diets, but you know, depending on whether your ancestors were Australian Aboriginal originals or South South American um, indigenous peoples from from uh, Peru or Brazil or, yeah. or uh, Germanic people, my, my, my 
um, ancestors came from Germany and Scotland and places like that. And those, all those places had a very different diet. Yes, that's the thing. I, I totally agree with that. There is not one paleo diet. There is many paleo diets depending where you came from. So you're going to be eating maybe a little more plants. Or if you are on a place where there was no plants, so you're going to be eating more animals. But there is not such a thing as a perfect diet. That's exactly true. So I think... That we have to approach this with respect for the diet of our ancestors. But yeah. more th the single most important thing is people have got to stop eating these highly processed foods. You know, I mean, to, to give a child, you know, sugar frosted cornflakes, cocoa puffs. I mean, it's really, in my opinion, it's uh, it's child abuse. Child abuse is against the law. You know, I mean, the, the definition of child abuse is knowingly, physically, or mentally harming a child. And you know, when you give them um, these highly processed sugary foods, you're abusing them, and you're mm -hmm. abusing their children and their grandchildren, and your gr their grandchildren. Yeah. So. Hey guys, what's up? Bruno Gama here, Brazilian Health Nut. And let's take a little break from the show because I would like to offer you something. If you go to my website, www.brazilianhealthnut.com and click on the page Burn Fat Forever, you can go ahead and claim your free consultation with me right now, okay? Or you can just send me an email at brazilianhealthnut at gmail.com. So you can start to lose weight and feel healthier right now, okay? So go ahead and claim your free consultation with me and remember that spots are limited, okay? Now let's get back to the show. Awesome. Uh, great. I would like to talk a little bit about your book. You wrote this book I have here called Epigenetics, Pottinger's Prophecy, How Food Resets Genes for Wellness or Illness. Can you talk a little bit about epigenetics, what it is for people who don't, who don't know? Sure, I sure can. Well, um, I'll go back to, to Pottinger, you know, I mean, when I read his book about the generational effect of diet and what was happening to the some of the things that were happening to the kittens is their faces became narrowed and their teeth were crooked and they became lethargic and they became either aggressive or reclusive and um, and um, they had sexual dysfunction and then I looked around even in my first profession I was working with school I was in the cartography business we I worked for a company that made maps and we sold them to schools and I was in schools all the time and I recognized before I knew anything about Pottinger or anything that the children in our, when, when I would go to a middle school, that the children looked different from my classmates when I was in middle school. And I'm going, gosh, I, I wonder why that is. And when I read Pottinger's work, I really understood that this was the result of epigenetics. Well, the term epigenetics wasn't even known yet, but, but clearly there was this generational effect. So for your listening audience, basically... You know what we what we what we've always believed is that our health was determined largely by our genetics, because you'd always know somebody that'd say, "Oh yeah, you know, my great uncle lived to be 104, and he smoked three packs of cigarettes, and you know, uh, and drank whiskey every day of his life." You know, well, he had true good genetics, but the thing is, um, genetics aren't the primary determinant. We know that now. That really. It's not the genes that you get, but it's how they're expressed. Yes, that's an, an exception for the rule. A lot of people bring the exception, but they don't see there is 100,000 other people dying earlier than this 104 years old. Right, right, exactly. And actually, a lot of those people that were, lived, lived to be an old age, even though they smoked and drank, their diet was actually very, very good. You know, so I, we I had some friends in a rural area where, where, where our son grew up, and they basically uh, um, lived off the land. You know, I mean, they, they picked berries, and they fished for salmon, and they ate shellfish, and every year they would hunt, and they did a deer, and they eat the hook deer and stuff. And they smoked, and they drank too, but they lived to be a ripe old age, you know. They would have, been, they would have lived another 10 or 15 years if they hadn't smoked. But, you know, they, they at least had the advantage of good diet. Yes. You know, I, I told somebody once, they were kind of shocked that I would say something, but I said, you know, if somebody told me that I had to eat margarine or smoke cigarettes, you know, one or the other, what would I pick? I said, I, heck, I'd rather smoke. At least when I smoked, I enjoyed that. <laughs> no, there's no redeeming thing about eating margarine. It doesn't taste good, and it's probably worse for you. Yeah. Eating hydrogenated oils is probably worse for you than smoking, you know? So, yeah, so I was talking to... 
the director and actor of the movie That Sugar Film. I don't know if you if you saw it. It's a new documentary uh, from Australia. And we, of course, we are talking a lot of about sugar, the, the problem with refined carbohydrates. But that's something that we don't hear much people talking about. It's the problems with uh, vegetable oils, margarine, soy oil, corn oil, all those kitchen oils that it's so common to see nowadays people using. And I think that's another topic to talk about in terms of uh, obesity, not just the sugar. Of course, the sugar is super important, but there is more than that. No, the fats are very, very important. They're, they're yeah. very important. In my book, of course, we point out you know, that they've actually shown in animal studies the profound effect that hydrogenated oils have on the epigenetics of uh, you know, the experimental animals. Let, let, me, let me step back just to finish my thought. Sure. What I want people to know is that your genetics are important, and they determine to a large degree you know, what, what you should be eating. But what's even more important is, your, is the way those genes are expressed. And the way they're expressed is what we call epigenetics. So you can turn good genes on, and you can turn bad genes off. The opposite is true. You can turn good genes off and bad genes on based on not just diet. You know, there's exercise factors. We know that pesticides and herbicides and other environmental toxins can, can have an effect on epigenetics. Right. That, um, but that um, we have control over this. We don't have control over the genes that we inherited, but the way they express themselves, we have, we have uh, control over. And, you know, at first, you know, when I was reading about you know, Pottinger's work, it's a little depressing because a lot of the young people today are the third generation and they've had their, their bad genes turned on for three generations and their good genes turned off and those have been carried down from one generation to the other. But the hopeful message that Dr. Pottinger gave us is that when he changed the diets of the cats, and just uh, uh, one little fact about Pottinger's study is that by the third generation of processed food, the cats couldn't reproduce. You know, they, they either lost interest in sexuality with mm -hmm. sexual behavior, uh, which we we see more and more. You know, people just not interested, or they had their their uh, their their uh, uh, they were infertile, or they uh, the uh, the female cats were not able to carry their kittens to term. And if you look at our society, we see all those problems today in modern reproduction. Something like. 18% of married couples can't reproduce without medical intervention. And yeah. so, but, but, the, but the good news was he changed that diet. When, when they could no longer reproduce, he took those cats that had crooked teeth and poor health and fatty livers, and he gave them the proper diet, and they were able to reproduce and have kittens. And the kittens weren't as healthy as the original kittens, but they were healthier than their parents. And when he found that by changing the diet in four generations, he was able to completely reverse the effects of the of the bad diet, and you know, to the point where the cats had their original kind of genetic perfection in their in their kind of uh, intended genetic expression. And so, I mean, I think our children are at a disadvantage, and um, but they but here's the the hope that everybody should have is that you can change the expression of your genes tomorrow by changing your diet, changing your exercise, changing you know, uh, 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 as much as possible to uh, clean up your environment. Yeah, changing your environment. There is a chapter uh, on your book called it's The Environment Stupid. <laughs> it's uh, to take control over the things that we have control, such as of, uh, diet, exercise, sleep, I think is super important, and stress and doing some stress management and trying to not get it too much toxic eating organic and all that kind of stuff and getting outdoors so we have we have control over a lot of things we just have to get into the habit of doing and changing our own mindset and environment so we can do those things easily exactly. yeah cool we have the power to change and, and um, you know so it's just really a matter of uh, of, um, of um, you know having a mindset changing our diet and doing the things that we need to do. I think one of the things you talk about, you know, losing weight, you know, forever is that the problem is that the methods I'm preaching to the choir now, because I know you probably know this better than I do, is that the methods that we've been using of calorie restriction and hyper exercise, that people can lose weight that way, but they can never maintain that. Exactly. They're not rebalancing their body. And the, you know, I know, I know how it was. You know, when I, I was addicted to fast food, and when I would go into a McDonald's, I was so uh, 
deficient in fats that eat that rancid nasty grease that reeks in those places it smelled good to me then because 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 um i i had uh you know uh, uh such deficiencies that even bad oil smelled good but once once you get those foods out of your life you really it's like you know people that smoke they go oh, i don't know how i could ever give up smoking I, I hate to admit it but you know i was a smoker at one time and i thought oh i really enjoy smoking but once you quit smoking, then smoking becomes repugnant to you, and you go, "Oh my gosh, how could anybody smoke those nasty things?" Yeah. But it's the same thing with food. You know, the idea for so many years, you know, I'd go into McDonald's or another fast food place, and I'd eat those French fries, and I'd drink the sodas, and I thought, "Oh, this is delicious, and I love it." But once you quit, it's like quitting smoking. The thought of it is repugnant to me. And so once you re reset your body, once you get the right fats into you. And once you get the, the, the uh, proper carbohydrates that are nutrient dense and don't have this huge glycemic spike, then you enjoy eating that way. You know, so that's what I what I love about our movement, Bruno, is everybody loves food. We're all a bunch of foodies. We love food, but we now we love the food that nourishes us uh, emotionally and physically. And, and that's what we want to eat. You know, we want to eat the grass-fed steak, you know, and we want to eat the cheese from raw sheep's milk. And mm -hmm. we want to, you know, we don't want, God, the idea of sitting down and drinking a Coca-Cola has so little appeal to me. It almost almost makes my stomach queasy. Thinking. Yeah. I had I had a soda like a month and a half ago. I was with my mom and my godmother traveling in Boston. And so at the end of the trip I was so tired and then we, we were eating and then I was like okay let me have a, a glass of soda and I felt horrible I felt like shaking I thought there was like something wrong with me and I was just like realized that I just had this um, crazy amount of liquid sugar and because you know I don't have that kind of food very often so your body get, gets affected right away and that's something that's really important I think for us to share with people I was talking to my brother, for example, you know, trying to make him improve his health. And he's like, but I don't like the flavor of this. I don't like the flavor of that. And I said, just give me some time. Just um, because, you're, like you said before, your body's going to go through a process of if drawing and your taste buds are going to change. So it's a matter of time. And then you're going to start enjoying this food more than what you're eating right now. Yeah, it's really true, and I I understand people skeptical because you know I didn't quite believe it myself when I started on the journey back to health. But you you know you really do, and so then what, once you enjoy healthy foods, and once you're used to eating whole foods, your body actually it's not, it's not that you can't overeat healthy foods. You can, but but the mechanisms of appetite are changed by healthy foods. So so healthy fats actually make you feel satiated and turn your appetite off, whereas the low-fat, high-glycemic diet doesn't, you never feel satiated, so you're, you're eating a low-fat, a low fat, maybe even a low-calorie diet, but you never stop because your body is constantly craving more and more and more, so. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about this low-fat, high-fat, low-carb, so all these ratios. Do you think that matters a lot? What's your take? Like, can somebody be healthy and lose weight on a high carbohydrate diet or in, on a high fat diet what do you think about this the ratio like a lot of people talk just about focus a lot on the ratio of uh, macronutrients well first i you know i want to you know go back to an earlier concept that everybody's different yes and that uh, i think i think kind of what happened you know like uh for, uh, for 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 dr atkins you know the high fat diet worked for him so then he believed everybody should be on the high fat diet for dean ornish the Low fat diet worked for him, so he thought everybody should be on the low fat diet. But I think I think that um, that that there's not one ratio that works for everybody. There's some general ratios, um, but um, but the most important thing about fat, more than the ratios, is that you have the qu the quality and the balance. Yes. So wh whatever you do, you have to have you you desperately need the nutrients from healthy saturated fats. And you need the so saturated fats have been so demonized, but the medium chain triglycerides we know now are actually the ones that you know run your metabolism and that they're healthy for your heart, and that and that you know you need these different types of fats too, even for good cell structure. So here's in a summary, here's what I think about fats: is it's 
It's not about high fat or low fat. It's about balance and quality. So, so the problem is with the American diet, it's way out of balance towards the polyunsaturates and the quality of those polyunsaturates is so horrible and they themselves are unbalanced in terms of the omega-6s and the omega-3s that it's the perfect storm. So the first thing we need to do is recognize that we shouldn't eat any fats that are highly processed. So if it's on the grocery store shelf in a clear plastic bottle, it's not food. It won't, it, it, it won't even support the life of microorganisms. So why would it be good for us? So I don't want to condemn all polyunsaturates because there are, you know, olive oil or, um, you know, uh, uh, walnut seed oil. Fish or, oil. Uh, Cotto oil, fish oil. Those are all polyunsaturates that can, that can be very healthy. But, you know, um, um, these highly processed um, um, clear oils, these canola oils, corn oils, soybean oil, almost all the soybean oil is from GMO soy. It's contaminated with glyphosate and other, you know, uh, farm pesticide and herbicide residues. And they're so highly processed that they have no, vi- they have no uh, fat-soluble vitamins, and even their even their uh, their structure is denigrated to where they don't make good cell walls anymore. So so it's it's really about so about the quality. It's about the quality and the balance. Exactly. Yeah, I like t- telling people. You know, you wouldn't go and date anybody. You have to be more picky, right? You wouldn't go and listen to any kind of music. You select the ones that you you think have better quality. So why don't you do that with your food? Yeah. Uh, before uh, we are, we could be talking here for another hour, but I want to be respectful of your time. Um, but I think we should talk a little bit about the work of Wesley A. Price for people who don't know. I think it's somebody who everybody should appreciate the his job for for especially on the nutritional side. Can you talk a little uh, in summary what who was Wesley A. Price? Great. Right? Sure I mean, he's he's one of my heroes. He's probably my greatest hero. I certainly admire what Pottinger did, but. But really, what Frank, what, what Weston Price did, was amazing. Really, he he Weston Price grew up on a farm in Canada where they most of the food they consumed was the food that was produced on their farm and was produced by their neighbors. And when he he went to dental school in the United States, and then he ended up settling in Cleveland. And what you have to realize is is the uh, the time frame when he practiced dentistry. He practiced dentistry from 1899 when food was, uh, processed food was relatively rare and most of the food, you know, transportation was slow. So even in a city like Cleveland, most of the food was from local farms and uh, locally raised meats and, and things like that. But by the time he finished practicing in 1930, you know, there'd been this huge urbanization and all the giant food companies that exist today, they had their start then, you know, Kellogg's and General Mills, and General Foods, in order to feed these new urban masses, you know, they had to figure out ways to preserve food um, so that it could be transported without refrigeration. Because the fr- refrigeration was, was almost non-existent and transportation was very slow. So, so, so people started eating uh, uh, sugary foods. They started eating more refined grains. Um, it was the very beginning of these vegetable oils. And Dr. Price, he had a large pediatric practice. He, he saw that from the time he started in 1899 until the time he finished practice in 1930, that there was a huge change in the, in the dental presentation of the children. Their faces were narrower. They had more uh, allergies and more asthma. They, uh, cavities. Cavities, way, way more cavities. Yeah. Crooked orthodontic problems. And so he, he asked himself the question, why is this change? And his hypothesis was that was because the diet changed. So what he did is he decided to travel around the world. He would find people who still ate their, indigenous peoples who still ate their traditional diet. And then he would compare it to people who ate uh, what he called the foods of commerce or the modern diet. And so, for example, he would go to... Um, uh, uh, northern Canada in Alaska and he would look at the Inuit people who ate a very, very high fat diet, very few vegetables uh, but still 
um, they had perfect teeth and they, they suffered no heart disease and no cancer. And then he would look at the same people who had moved into the trading centers where they were you know, trading with uh, white, white people for sugar and canned foods and flour and things like that. He would look at, at their teeth and he would see this remarkable difference just as a result of this dietary change. So he did that all over the world. He did it in Africa. He did it in the Great Barrier Reef Islands, the Aboriginal people. He even his very first journey was doesn't seem so exotic, but it, he studied the remote people of Switzerland who lived in the high valleys where they didn't have access to uh, 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 processed foods. Ate their 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 diet that they had been eating for you know uh, thousands of years, hundreds and years, and th even thousands of years. And he compared it to modern Swiss children who were living. In the in the big cities and eating a lot of cocoa and you know breakfast cereals and sugar and stuff and even there there was this profound difference in their overall health their um, dental presentation of course that was his main focus but even their outlook on life you know that he found that the people who in every culture whether they were African um, um, you know herds people or Great Barrier Reef Islanders or Inuit people that wherever people ate their indigenous diets, he found that they had a sense of of, uh, of uh, spirituality, a sense of connectedness, and a sense of peace that that the people who had been modernized had lost. You know that then people became you know when they ate all this sugar and processed oils that they became more frenzied and they they st oh, you know would be they would be more anxious and they were became disconnected from. From whatever their whatever their spiritual beliefs were, and, you know, I think you you see that you know in modern society you know our our children not just our children but so many people are just so disconnected and so completely lack any sense of of um, of a self as it relates to our um, this, our spiritual part of our of our lives and uh, so uh, anyway he was a remarkable man he traveled. Like 150,000 miles. I might have that figure wrong. He tra traveled tens of thousands of miles to some of the most remote parts on on the Earth at a time when that was very, very difficult. And um, he did it because of this immense curiosity. And he came back with a, a tremendous amount of data. And really, from him, you know, we garner the lessons of health that you know guide us at the Nutritional Therapy Association. You know, the, the respect for ancestral diet. The idea that we we all are different, you know, that there's not one diet for everybody. That it really really depends on, you know, what our ancestors ate, and that he gives us, you know, the guidelines to restore our health. You know, the basic principles that we need to uh, be healthy again. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, nutritional and physical degeneration by Wesley Price. It's my bible for nutrition. I always recommend people this amazing, amazing book. Uh, last question I have for you, Gray is okay people are motivated here now you know they listen to you they probably have a lot of information in their heads if you have to tell one thing for them to do like what's the thing they should be doing right now to go towards the journey of losing weight forever eat real food i mean just that's the most basic answer is that when if people if whatever else they do if they get rid of all the processed foods and they they eat uh, is the fresh vegetables and good quality meats and high quality dairy, hopefully raw and unprocessed, and um, and uh, the, to the degree that we eat process. I mean, our, our ancestors processed foods. They they cultured their vegetables, you know, and the things like sauerkraut, and they and they made you know yogurt from fresh milk, you know, to these things to preserve it. But the the more we get back, the more the more we shun. Uh, processed foods and eat real foods, the mechanisms in our body will actually guide us to eat in balance again. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's the processed foods that throw us out of balance and confuse our, our, our sense of appetite. So yeah, just eat real food. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Gray. Uh, Gray. Uh, last uh, question, where can people find more about you, what you're working on right now, what's the next step for you? Well, thanks for asking. Well, of course, you know, my, my greatest accomplishment is the, I'm the founder of the Nutritional Therapy Association. And, you know, it's certainly an emerging profession. We went from just a few years ago to training 200 students a year to, to this, year, this year. 
we'll have close to 700 uh, students in class. So any, anyone that's interested in uh, seeking a new profession, you know, they, they should definitely explore, you know, the, an education as, to become a nutritional therapy practitioner, nutritional therapy consultant. But for, for the masses who just really want good uh, information, good supervision, they can seek out a nutritional therapy practitioner in their community to help them with their, with their uh, 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 dietary, um, you know, journey back to health. Um, and um, so uh, you can uh, go to nutritionaltherapy.com. And I um, also want to put a plug in for the Price Pottinger Nutrition Foundation, PPNF.org. Or, which is in San Diego. If you haven't been over yes. there, you should go visit. I'm there. actually going to Dave's class right after here. Dave Getoff. Very good. Yeah. yeah. Be sure and tell them all there. I said hi. I'm on their cool. And, of course, the other uh, wonderful Weston A. Price uh, Foundation has uh, done wonderful work in educating people. And uh, if anybody's interested in uh, reading the first part of my book, you can go to Price to PottingersProphecy.com and you can download the fir first chapter for free. And of course, it's available in, um, as an ebook or in um, um, most of the major bookstores uh, either carry it or have it available. It's called Pottinger's Prophecy How Food Resets Genes for Wellness or Illness. And, um, you know, I'm just, uh, you know, uh, 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 working, you know, to expand nutritional therapy association as i mentioned uh, before we're now uh, teaching classes i'm personally teaching a class in australia and canada so it's exciting uh, i'm uh, hoping that someday we'll have a uh, you have to take it to brazil speaking instructor yeah somebody that speaks <laughs> portuguese can go to brazil and to portugal yes it definitely needs some well, a lot of nutritional therapy practitioners in brazil definitely thank you so much i super appreciate your time and have a good day Thanks for your enthusiasm and thanks for having me uh, on this interview. I hope to see you again soon, bro. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Brazilian Health Nut Show. Go to www.brazilianhealthnut.com for much more information about how to burn fat for the rest of your life. Hasta luego.